I'm Spencer Bailey. This is Time Sensitive. Hey everyone, for this episode, our 101st, our sound engineer Johnny and I jumped in the car and headed to New Hope, Pennsylvania. There we stopped by the bucolic woodworking mecca that is the George Nakashima House studio and workshop where I interviewed Mira Nakashima. We recorded this conversation inside the reception house, also known as the Sanso Villa, and honestly, I don't think I'll ever record in a more serene or beautiful space than that. We kept a window open to intentionally capture the bird chirps. You may hear a few of them. There was a particularly noisy bird. And toward the end of the episode, a walnut or two fell loudly on the roof. Johnny, meanwhile, sat on a tatami mat inside an adjacent tea ceremony room. For the uninitiated, a bit about Mira. She is an architect and furniture maker and the president and creative director of George Nakashima Woodworker which was founded by her woodworker and furniture maker father, the George Nakashima. Mira has been working on the property since 1970, and following George's death in 1990, she has entirely overseen the business. Over the past 30-plus years, Mira has not only carved out a name for herself, stepping outside of her legendary father's long shadow, she has also continued on humbly in building upon his time-honored traditions, further cementing his legacy. On the episode, we discuss the George Nakashima Foundation for Peace and the three peace altars that have been completed to date, the enduring karma yoga influence of the Indian philosopher, yogi, maharishi, and poet Sri Aurobindo, whom her father once worked for as an architect and studied under, and her approach to and vision for keeping the Nakashima woodworkers' craftsmanship alive. Before we get into the episode, I'd first like to thank our Season 8 presenting sponsor, the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels, which this year is working with the American Museum of Natural History in New York to present the exhibition Garden of Green, Exquisite Jewelry by Van Cleef and Arpels at the museum's Mignone Hall of Gems and Minerals. On view through March 2024, Garden of Green showcases 44 creations from the French High Jewelry House, 32 of which are on view in the U.S. for the first time. Creating a lush garden of jewelry, this impressive array of precious and ornamental green stones forms a dazzling journey that celebrates the beauty of gardens and nature. One area of the exhibition space highlights a diversity of green stones. Another concentrates on particular materials, such as jade, chrysoprase, and malachite. And a third displays a selection of majestic creations set with emeralds. You can learn more at www.amnh.org exhibitions. That's www.amnh.org slash exhibitions. And now, here's my conversation with Mira. Hi, Mira. Welcome to Time Sensitive. Thank you. Nice to see you. (laughs) I thought we'd start today's conversation on the subject of peace. Hmm. In 1995, you formed the Nakashima Foundation for Peace, and your father dreamed of designing peace altars all over the world. In 1986, he was able to attend the consecration of his first peace altar at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York. And when he died in 1990, I understand flowers were placed upon it at an interfaith memorial service to him. Another peace altar was also installed at the Russian Academy of Art in Moscow in 1989, and a third one consecrated in Oroville, India, in 1996. Could you share a bit about the mission of this foundation and also your dad's vision for the peace altars? Well, uh, first of all, the Foundation for Peace started percolating in 1984, with the acquisition of this humongous uh, walnut log that inspired my father to make altars for peace. So the Peace Foundation has been in existence since around 1985. Um, He wanted these altars uh, to be in every continent of the world someday, and he wanted it to be 
a people to people movement. Um, he said when governments and and big corporations get involved with their money, you can't attain peace. But on a personal level, if everybody just gave ten dollars each in all the continents of the world, that we would have money to build peace altars on each continent, and everyone you know in those countries would be involved. So that was his dream. Uh, we haven't gotten very far with that dream. He, he, his first altar was created in 1986. And then when he passed away in 1990, he, was, he had several files of contacts, which he had acquired over the years to try to place a peace altar in Russia. And uh, Russia was uh, churning and, and things were turning over and he'd think he'd have a, you know, he thought he had a contact and a place to send a peace altar and and then they would change the administration and nobody knew what he was talking about and he'd have to start all over again. Irene Goldman, who's uh, one of my friends and colleagues, had come, she majored in Russian and speaks Russian fluently, has a number of uh, Russian artists as friends, and she had brought over a group of Russian artists to visit the studio. Dad was so inspired with these Russian artists visiting the studio, he started, he got up and started spouting off a poem in Russian. And these Russian people were, you know, wondering if their ears were telling them the truth or not. Here they were in the USA in a house that looked sort of Japanese with this man who looked Japanese, and he was speaking Russian to them, and they couldn't figure out why that happened. But it turned out that when my father was in Paris, his best friend was a Russian expatriate, and they used to teach each other their languages in their spare time, I guess. <laughs> Dad taught him Japanese, and he taught Dad some Russian. So he had memorized that poem in the 1930s, and it just bubbled to the surface and came out with this group of Russian artists. So among those artists, people... Uh, was one person who eventually became the, the vice president of the Academy of Arts in Moscow. They were fascinated by the idea of peace altars. And um, they, uh, Irene Goldman uh, maintained contact with her artist friends in, in Moscow when things were friendlier. <laughs> and we eventually found a home. Dad had been searching all over Moscow to, uh, not all over Moscow, all over Russia, to find an appropriate place and an appropriate organization to host an altar for peace. There was many problems. One was space, one was the organization, um, and the willingness to host programs around uh, a peace altar. But Irene, after I think it was 12 years of traveling back and forth and talking to all different kinds of people, eventually settled on the... Uh, Academy of Arts in the middle of Moscow because one of those artists um, had come to the studio on that particular day. And we we sent the peace altar there and uh, we created it in 19, I think it was 1996 or seven, but it didn't get to Moscow until 2001, I think it was. It had gone to the Hague Appeal for Peace in 1999 and then was in storage. And then they couldn't find a, a plane that was big enough to carry it to Moscow. And it finally got there. We finally installed it in it maybe one of the very few ecumenical <laughs> celebrations in Moscow in 2001. So that was the, the long culmination of a, a dream for peace. I don't know whether it's actually brought us any closer to peace or not, but it was his dream. And then when my father passed away in 1990, we decided that the second mission of our Peace Foundation should be to preserve the Nakashima properties. There's a lot of really extraordinary architecture on the property here. And uh, it, we hope that it will be preserved for generations to come. And we thought that because we already had a nonprofit um, in existence, that we would revise the bylaws to include the preservation of the Nakashima legacy. So that increased its responsibilities a great deal. I think when you 
come into this property, you do have a sense that it's different from other places, that there is this sense of peace. And it's partly through the architecture, but it's partly through the the spirit of the land and, and the spirit of my father, which lives on here. And so, anyway, that's sort of why we're here. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. I mean, I, I, I realized I probably got a couple of those <laughs> dates wrong with the peace altars because there was so much happening, I feel like, at once, especially toward the end of your father's life. He, he was still bubbling and bursting with ideas till the very end. <laughs> yeah, he was. And being here in this place, I love that you drew this connection both in terms of creating, you know, extending the mission and vision for the foundation, but also the fact that when you are here, there is this sense of peace that comes over you. I would also say there's a sort of sense of sacred space uh, that you feel. Would you agree with that? I do, yes. And um, the building where we are sitting now, the uh, reception house, was the last building my father built. This was uh, built in 1975. And he built a dining table for this building, which is almost exactly the same shape as our peace altars, but it was before he acquired the wood for his peace altar project. So I, when I bring tours in here, I tell them this was the, the prototype peace altar. And it's a wonderful shape. It's the, the Russians used to speak of it, too. They said there's something called a, a krugly stol, a, a round table in Russian, and it has not just the implication that it is round, but that it brings people together, you know, in a different way than a rectangular table does. So it's a sort of a free-form round, but it does have a unifying effect. Um, if you're sitting around a table that shape, you end up in one conversation instead of in several little conversations as you tend to do with a rectangular table. Well, I, I love the notion of a table as an altar because we think of altars and they're all about presentation. You're standing at the altar, but with a table, you have this, you're, you're sitting and you're coming together. It's, it's a place of breaking bread, of having dialogue. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, though Dad really believed that it should be a sacred table, um, which is why it was called a peace altar. And then when we went to Moscow, they said, oh, you can't call it an altar because an altar has specific dimensions and a specific place and a specific church. <laughs> and uh, we wanted it to be universally uh, acceptable. So we started calling it the sacred peace table. And um, I think my father, I don't know, he, I think he wanted it to be used as a, a ritual center. When he had it, you know, he described his dream, he thought that people would come in processions and they would bring flowers and put them on the table and they would burn incense and sing songs and say prayers around the table, not necessarily to sit and eat as we do at this table, but I think it will have many uses in each place it goes, and I hope it has more homes than it does now. The one in uh, India we made at a lower height so that people actually could sit at it, and they use it mostly for meetings. That's a wonderful thing to do, too. And, and they're international meetings. In the city of Oroville, India, it's an international community. And uh, for years, they had no place to gather and to sort out their differences because they all had different interpretations of Sri Aurobindo's philosophy and, and they would, how it applied to society and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And they were, I guess they were prone to having arguments. And the table has actually been a very unifying effect in Oroville. And we're, that's a beautiful thing, too. <laughs> I think each continent it goes to is going to have a different flavor. Mm. And uh, they certainly have so far. The one in, uh, in New York, the original one, uh, with the previous pastor, it was used daily uh, for uh, Spanish Mass. I think it was Spanish Mass. And now they sort of tucked it in an alcove, and I'm not sure if it gets used the way it was supposed to or not, but that was the original intention, that it would be used. Dad was very uh, insistent uh, that people use their furniture. I mean, uh, we delivered a table to a friend this week, and she said, oh, it's so beautiful, we don't want to use it. And then we have sent furniture to people's homes, and they say, oh, we spilled something on it. Oh, we scratched it. What do we do? And 
Dad would always tell him, just use it. <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect. In yeah. fact, he said there's nothing so uninteresting as a, a perfect finish. We try to do a perfect finish before it leaves, but um, it's, it's meant it's to be lived patina. with. <laughs> well, in my dad's time, it was called Kevinizing. It was named after my little brother. <laughs> he would nick it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Beyond the peace altars and, and just sort of continuing this sacred space idea, it, it's something that's so central to your father's work, but also to your work. I know that in 2000, you created doors for the congregation B'nai Keshet in Montclair, New Jersey. Your father designed a series of churches, architectural spaces, including a renovation of a church here in New Hope. And for a Benedictine community, a monastery in New Mexico, as well as a retreat center near San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. Your dad also did a chapel and furnishings for a space in Greenberg, Pennsylvania, a place where later you were asked to develop designs yourself. Could you talk a little bit about this engagement with the sacred and the divine and how you think about it in the context of your work, your dad's work? Well, um, I think my father started his business through his love and respect for trees. I mean, that was kind of something that he grew up with. Uh, he grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and he was in Boy Scouts, and he used to do a lot of hiking, some of it solo hiking. And uh, he developed this respect for nature and for trees. And uh, because of that, he went to University of Washington and studied forestry for two years before he switched to architecture. And then eventually, I mean, he went through a lot of architectural work. He graduated from MIT in 1930 and uh, decided the best thing to do during the Depression was to travel around the world. So he, he, um, he sold his car and bought a steamship ticket around the world and went back to Paris and bummed around Paris. Um, where he bumped into Ivan Vishnogrodsky, uh, the Russian expatriate. And then he eventually ended up in Japan and worked for, in the office of Anton and Raymond from 1934 to 39. No, actually it wasn't 39. He left the Raymond office in 1938 uh, to become a disciple of Shura Bindo because he was working on Golkond and he thought he was going to stay there the rest of his life. I think it was... You know, partly because of the experience of being alone on the mountaintop in the Pacific Northwest, that he had this respect for nature and love of trees. And then when he was building Golkond, he had a very, very strong sense of the sacredness in materials. So he brought all of that with him when he came and saw what they were doing in architecture in the USA and, and decided he was going to make furniture instead. He, um, he said he would, if, if he had to make it out of plastic or steel, he wouldn't want to make furniture. He only wanted to make it out of wood because that's what he loved. <laughs> Your dad considered himself a, a, quote, Japanese druid. He also identified as a Hindu Catholic Shaker Japanese American. I was hoping maybe you could speak to this sort of alchemy of identities and, uh, and, and, and how it comes to life in his work and here at the Nakashima compound. And, and also, I think, in your life and work, I, I'd love to hear how that sort of identity filtered down to you. Well, that's a pretty complex identity. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Japanese-American, of course, is just in our blood, Dad's parents were immigrants. They came from Japan in the, around the turn of the century. And they lived on the West Coast where there was a stronger Japanese uh, community than there is on the East Coast. But during the war, we were all incarcerated because we looked like we were a part of the people who were fighting the war on the other side of the Pacific. And you were just six months old, right? I was only six weeks old. Six weeks. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> So I don't remember very much, luckily. But Dad was interesting. He was second-generation Japanese, which are called Nisei. And most of the Nisei that I knew, I didn't know that many because we moved to the East Coast. Um, and that happened 
thankfully, through uh, Dad's former employer, Antonin Raymond, who had left Japan and bought an old farmhouse in Pennsylvania and sponsored us to leave camp. Uh, Dad was employed as a chicken farmer, but it did get us out of camp, and it got us to Pennsylvania. Uh, so w I grew up with almost no other Japanese Americans around, whereas the people on the West Coast after the war went back to their communities along the West Coast, and, and they had a whole set of different ways of looking at things and different problems than we did. My dad's younger brother uh, was living in Iowa, so he was not incarcerated. In fact, he was a medical doctor, and he was in the U.S. Army. <laughs> but um, uh, the rest of us along the West Coast were put into these camps, and apparently that uncle's children were told, don't even think you're Japanese because of the war. You know, they didn't want to be identified as Japanese. So they didn't even think they were Japanese. The, my cousin who did the Nakashima documentary, John Terry Nakashima, said he never even knew what sushi was till he was 40-something. <laughs> Poor man. <laughs> but, <laughs> what a loss. <laughs> but it was interesting because he was trying to uh, discover his Japanese roots when he was creating uh, the documentary on my father. And we did go back to Japan. That was the first trip for him. And we interviewed a lot of Japanese people. He doesn't speak a word of Japanese, so I did the interviewing and uh, sort of rough translation for him. Uh, so but anyway, Dad did not reject his Japanese heritage the way most of the Japanese Americans did after the war. He embraced it and um, respected it, and that was why I guess he called himself a Japanese druid. And there's a sensibility uh, that the Japanese have, at least they used to have, I think it's kind of wearing thin now with industrialization, but they have a very um, strong respect for nature and the forms of nature. And I didn't realize how the spaces here and the architecture here it has a very Japanese, and the landscape architecture too, has a Japanese sensibility, even though it's not in Japan. But I didn't realize that till I came back from Japan the first time. The first time I went to Japan, I thought, oh, this is the first time in my life that there, there are other people the same size and same hair color as me. And that was I was happy to be there. Nobody understood me. I mean, I couldn't understand Japanese and they couldn't understand English. So that was a, a problem, but I, I sort of felt that this is this is where I came from. This is where I, you know, part of me should be. <laughs> but I didn't realize how the Japanese aesthetic had been transplanted to Pennsylvania till I came back from Japan. Yeah, and, and I would say some of that is the Zen aesthetic, mm -hmm. um, which certainly comes to life, to use one example, in, in the Katsura Imperial Villa in Kyoto, which... It's uh, maybe not a direct link, but you can certainly see some links between that place and this place. That was one of my father's favorite buildings, which is why there are some links. <laughs> <laughs> when he was in the Raymond office, his best friend was Junzo Yoshimura, and he took him to places like the, the Katsuro Detached Palace because he wanted him to see the finest examples of Japanese architecture. And it wasn't, you know, what... Other people defined uh, necessarily as the finest examples of Japanese architecture, but it was for Junzo. And uh, it, uh, that really made a very, very strong impression on my father. Your father also was really proud of his samurai ethic and ancestry. Your great-grandfather, Katsuyoshi Nakashima, was the son of the last samurai in the family. Could you share a bit about this samurai legacy and how samurai thinking fits its way into your dad's life and the life here, I guess. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny that uh, he created a, a foundation for peace <laughs> 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 coming from a warrior background. But temperamentally, he was very much a, a warrior. You didn't fool with that. And my mother was the same way. My mother was also from a samurai family, <laughs> which is why they decided they had a whole lot in common. They were both born and brought up in the Seattle area and educated there. Uh, but they had met uh, in Tokyo just by chance. Mom was coming back from Australia. Dad was coming back from India 
just before the war, and they uh, happened to meet each other in Tokyo. And uh, but they had that, that samurai bond. They were tough. <laughs> no nonsense with them. No fooling around. No cheating. <laughs> Um, and they were, well, they didn't necessarily fight, although they did fight. <laughs> um, but they were they were very very strong. And when Dad was uh, alive in the shop, you know, the fellows in the shop were afraid of him. I mean, they didn't dare trespass anything he said or fool around in the shop because you never knew when he was going to show up and and you know reprimand you for something or other um he was very strict yeah there was a rigor oh yeah and a discipline and a frugality um uh, my parents uh, my grandparents as well were very frugal they didn't spend money uh, mother complained because now dad never spent money on vacations so when he had a job somewhere in the world like mexico or japan my mother and brother would tag along and that was their vacation <laughs> So um, they were very frugal, and that's part of being a samurai also. You don't spend money on frivolous things. And you mentioned Sri Aurobindo earlier. Yes. I wanted to bring him back into the conversation. Could you share about who a bit about who he was, how your father met him, and the long-term impact he had on your father and in a roundabout way on, on Nakashima woodworkers today? Yeah, it's not really a, a roundabout way. Um, my father, he um, bought the steamship ticket around the world and, and was, was bumming around the world and, and ended up in uh, Tokyo. And then his father told him to get a job, so he got a job with Anton and Raymond. And one of Raymond's major projects was this uh, building, a, a disciples' dormitory in South India, which was called Golkond, and he needed an architect on site to supervise it because nobody had done reinforced concrete there before. So he sent my dad, or my dad volunteered, and he was there, and um, it was a tough job. I mean, they had to import every single thing, and they had to teach people how to do concrete because it had never been done before. The specs were all drawn up in Japan, and they didn't have a lot of the brass fittings, the the hinges and doorknobs and things that were specified on the drawings from Japan weren't available in India. So they had to set up a foundry and the mother of the ashram collected uh, brass uh, plates and vessels and had them melted down and made into brass fittings for this building. Anyway, it was quite an adventure. And uh, dad became a disciple of Sri Aurobindo during the process. He was so taken with the peace and the uh, the atmosphere of the ashram, that he became a member of the ashram in 1938, and he thought he was going to stay there for the rest of his life. And he himself had uh, undergone a fair amount of, of um, I guess you'd call it psychic trauma while he was there. <laughs> uh, it was a very powerful learning experience for him because he came, he was educated in the West, and and architects are notoriously known for being egotistic, and he ran into conflicts with, with some of the other architects on the job. But in the end, uh, he, he learned and respected the teaching of Shurabindo, which was, you know, is, is basically knowing the way to peace is through um, knowing how to control your ego and not let it get in your way, and also knowing that beauty is defined as something from the divine, that it's not something created by human beings. Human beings are just the conduit for beauty to emerge in the world. And that's basically called karma yoga. And he um, he became a karma yogi uh, back in the 1930s. And um, he proudly called himself the world's first hippie <laughs> back in the 30s. Yeah, we left the hippie part out earlier. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of his, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, well, he was many a man of many facets. Well, I, I, I love this karma yoga idea because I think most people assume you have to be in a yoga pose to do yoga. <laughs> but really, this this idea was, was almost craft as yoga, that creating beauty is a form of yoga. And that creativity can be this way of doing yoga. 
Exactly. Yes. If you let it work through you. And that was the fundamental lesson that he learned while he was at the ashram. When my cousin John and I went to India to, to interview some of uh, the disciples who had known my father in the year 2000, we went there and we luckily got an interview with Udar, who was my father's partner in building Golkhand. He was uh, the engineer end of the of the architecture, and uh, Dad was the design end of it. <laughs> but they were really good friends. And we got it to interview uh, Udar, but there was also a woman who was the head of the art house in Pondicherry in the ashram. And I went to her just informally one day, and, and I was just having conversation. And she said the most beautiful things about art and how it comes from the divine and goes through your hands and and goes into what you're making, and, and that is your karma yoga. And it was just so beautiful. I said, oh, Terry, we have to go back and record her. And we went back and 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 tried to record her, and it was just like putting a hot light on a frail little flower. She just folded up and didn't say anything. It was so <laughs> disappointing because <laughs> it was so beautiful what she said the first time. Since we're talking about time on this podcast, to a certain extent, it is the name of the podcast, yes. Time Sensitive. I, I wanted to bring up time in relation to your primary medium here, Wood, and also mention your dad's book on the subject, The Soul of a Tree. How do you philosophically think about time from the perspective of trees? And also in the wood you choose and use to create the magical things you make here. Mm -hmm. Well, I used to feel badly when um, something died on the property. I mean, the trees are always dying um, in little bit bits or sometimes big bits. <laughs> And now that I'm getting older, all my friends uh, are, or my certainly my parents' friends, are dying and leaving this world. But it's just part of life. I mean, they're born at a certain time in history, and they grow a certain way because of where they're planted. And after a certain amount of period of time, they they need to die. And um, Dad said when he, uh, if he had to cut down a living tree, he wouldn't have the heart to do it. But he said it's kind of like eating meat. Uh, somebody else does the killing. <laughs> it's okay. It's gone anyway. <laughs> um, but most of the wood we harvest has uh, reached maturity and is on the way out already or has actually fallen over or endangering somebody's house or is in the way when they're building a road or um, so we are almost entirely as far as I know sustainably harvested we have a, uh, a logger who lives near here <laughs> he was the assistant to my dad's logger so he's been on a lot of tree adventures <laughs> during his lifetime and it, it's always comforting to know that he takes down the trees that nobody wants anymore or are dying or dead anyway. And Dad had this, I haven't read his book for a while, so I forget where that quote came from, but once a tree is down, if it just stays in the forest, it will eventually rot and provide soil for another generation of trees. But if we bring it in and harvest it, dry it and take care of it, and eventually make it into something useful, uh, we're actually giving the trees a second life. And it's pretty amazing. You never know exactly what's going to be inside of a tree until you put it on the mill and start slicing it and look inside. Because every tree is a different, it's like human beings. Everyone is different. Even though they're all walnut trees, they, they've they lived different lives in different places. And, and you can see... Well, Dad said in his book, no, in his video, I guess he said, that you, sometimes you can look into the grain of a tree and it, it's speaking. It's speaking torrents uh, if you could only understand them. And some people understand that, some people don't. But you can usually see the evidence of what a tree has gone through in a plank of wood. And you don't really see that fully. I mean, you see it, you get a good glimpse of it when it is first on the carriage at the sawmill and you get a glimpse of, 
of, of what was inside this tree. And then you have to dry it for a number of years and you f- sort of forget what that looked like. And then it comes back into the shop and you make it into something and you see all this life that the tree went through and then you sand it down and send it into the finishing room. And the finishing room, when they apply the coats of oil, is when you actually get to see deeper and deeper into the life of that tree. And it, I don't know, to me, it's you know, finishing itself is probably a pretty boring occupation because you just put oil on and wipe it off all day long. But just seeing, seeing the, the wood come to life, is, it's, it's like a miracle. Hey everyone, taking a quick break here to tell you a little bit about our Season 8 presenting sponsor, the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels, which this year is working with the American Museum of Natural History in New York to present the exhibition Garden of Green, exquisite jewelry by Van Cleef and Arpels at the museum's Mignone Hall of Gems and Minerals. On view through March 2024, Garden of Green showcases 44 creations from the French High Jewelry House, 32 of which are on view in the U.S., for the first time. Creating a lush garden of jewelry, this impressive array of precious and ornamental green stones forms a dazzling journey that celebrates the beauty of gardens and nature. To learn more, visit www.amnh.org slash exhibitions. That's www.amnh.org slash exhibitions. And now, back to the episode. You spent 20 years working with your father, who produced, by my count, 96 designs in his lifetime, plus nine more that you've revived. And you have 17 of your own designs. Maybe some of these numbers are a little off. I tried to count (laughs) as best I could. And since his death in 1990, you've now spent 33 years running and shepherding George Nakashima Woodworkers Forward. Could you speak to the before and after? In hindsight, how do you think about this time, those two decades with your father, but then now the three-plus decades since? Well, when I came back in 1990, uh, 1970, sorry, I think it was a, a pretty good bribe. Dad had bought some property across the road, and he was building a house, and he um, he said he wanted me to come home and live in that house, and then I... Um, then he said I could work for him part time if I wanted to, and so I tried to work part time for him. But I was definitely the understudy for twenty years. In the beginning, I was mother's gopher. I, you know, I was I was a filing assistant, and uh, back in, when I first started, um, we had manual typewriters. We did not have computers, so every order that came through um, had to be written up by hand um, in, in an order book. Then it was transferred to three by five cards that were done in duplicate. So not only did you have to cut carbon paper in the right size for three and f- three by five uh, inch cards, but you had to put them in a manual typewriter and type them. And every time an order changed, you had to redo it all over again. I went to architectural school. I graduated with a master's in architecture from Waseda University and course I had kids in the meantime and couldn't really work full time but I thought my goodness why did I get an architectural degree if this is my job <laughs> but in my spare time I was allowed to work in the workshop so I got to make small things and tables and I think I probably even helped a little bit in the chairs and learn how to you know shave spindles and things like that and then as time went on um, dad got older and needed more and more help. So I got to do more and more of the drawings and then I would, you know, trail around after him. And he would, he insisted that I go with him to the sawmill and watch the milling process. Cause that was to him, it's, it's kind of like Michelangelo. You have to start with the right material and get the right stuff and cut the, uh, the wood at the right thickness for certain different uses and, and you have to know which way to the grain is going to be the most beautiful, and you, you turn the log to capture you know the best part of the log uh, uh, before you mill it. So that was really good training, and I enjoyed that. And then as time went on, Dad got a stroke, uh, had a pretty severe stroke toward the end of his life, but he didn't quite understand what it meant. I remember 
He used to go around the shop every day and supervise what was going on and tell the people what to do and what not to do and which wood to use and all that stuff. And he went around after he had a stroke and one of our workmen had a round burl. Not very often do we have burls that have free edges all the way around. And Dad had taken his chalk like he usually does. And he'd marked to cut off all of those free edges all the way around the table. And the workman came to me and he says, George marked this this way. Do you really want me to cut off all the free edges? And I said, please don't. Thank you. And then some of the drawings he would do, it was interesting. He had a he had a left brain stroke, I guess, or was it a right? Anyway, the left-hand part of his drawing would be almost perfect, and the right-hand part of his drawing would be completely out of scale and unintelligible because of the hemisphere of his brain, which was affected by the stroke. And so one day I was redrawing his drawing, and he says, what are you doing? And I said, well, I I needed to fix it because they can't use it this way. And it was kind of sad that he, you know, he realized that he was limited now and he couldn't do everything he did. But he, he went around, you know, supervising the shop in his own way until the end of his life. You know, he just lived in the shop and he loved the shop and he loved what was going on. And But little by little, he would tell me more about why he did what he was doing and how he did what he was doing. So that was a good thing. He Somehow the stroke also loosened his tongue. I mean, he didn't talk much when, when I was growing up. He got mad sometimes. And <laughs> he fired me about five times. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't talk much. And then after he had a stroke, he began to be more verbal and would sort of tell me why he did things the way he did, which was a blessing. And what about this sort of 30 years post? I know most immediately following your father's death, the shop made his coffin out of walnut. We did. Could you talk about that moment and experience? I imagine doing that must have been so cathartic in some way. And also, as you wrote in Nature, Form, and Spirit, his loss created this immense vacuum. So in the face of this vacuum, you're kind of doing one or two final projects for him in a way. Yeah, no, it, um, I don't remember why. Oh, I guess we decided that we didn't like those commercial coffins and dad wouldn't either, so we should make him one. So I designed one and then everybody in the shop pitched in to make it. And it was kind of a beautiful thing. It was like a dance. And normally only one person will work on one project at a time, but everybody in the shop cooperated and, and worked on one part of the, the coffin. And, uh, it, you know, they sort of danced around each other in the machine room and, and, and made this nice coffin for my father. So, And you made a memorial to him a couple years later in 1993, the Nakashima Reading Room. Oh, yes. Well, that was, that was commissioned by the Michener Museum, and they said they had been wanting to commemorate my father somehow, and they didn't know. And, of course, they didn't get around to it during his lifetime, That they decided they wanted something. And they were building a new wing. Um, the, are you familiar with the Michener Museum? No. It was It was built on the site of the old jail <laughs> in Doylestown. And uh, they decided they need to expand uh, their exhibition area. So they were building a new wing. And there was this one area that they decided that would be the Nakashima Memorial Room. And it was um, it was sort of set off from the rest of the museum. So I went over to look at it and did a design and decided on some materials and decided to put shoji screens against their steel mullion windows and, and uh, some benches made of elm uh, that had come from an old tree in... Uh, Yardly, then I I chose the color of the the walls, which I uh, would uh, were kyo kabe, the, the same kind of walls that we have here, which are kind of a natural, funny green color. And we started putting that together, and then the the designers were putting together the color scheme for the rest of the museum. And I thought, oh my goodness, this isn't going to fit at all. <laughs> 
but uh, it eventually worked. The problem we had was that because uh, the shoji screens are such good insulators, it was a very cold year, and there was ice that was forming in the shoji tracks because the windows were sweating uh, because of the humidity control in the museum. And the, the shoji screens created this insulator so the water dripped down from the uh, windows into the, the shoji tracks and then it froze. <laughs> so we had to um, modify the windows. We put some strip uh, heaters on, on the window millions, but now it's, now it's fine. <laughs> I found it interesting to learn that George's last project was your first rebuilding this collection of furniture that your father's friends had lost in a fire. There's such a profound transference in that, that this project he had begun at the end of his life, you were beginning in your sort of new post-George life. I was wondering what it was like to work on that and that it was replacing furniture that had been lost in a fire seems so prophetic. <laughs> yes, yeah. We were very close to the Krosniks. They had ordered furniture, I think, initially in the 1950s, and they lost their entire collection. Um, I think it was just before my father's last show opened in New York in uh, 1989. You know, they came and they were just devastated. These were wealthy people who had not only lots of Nakashima furniture, but this beautiful house in Princeton and artwork. They had a Ben Sean collection and I think musical instrument collection and and uh, the missus had lots of jewelry and, and you know beautiful clothes and all that stuff. So it's all gone and they were just devastated. I think they didn't have anything but the clothes on their back because they had to escape the fire. And they came over and dad said to them, oh we'll rebuild it for you Evelyn. And that was a comfort for them. They were they had to live in a hotel for three years, but they rebuilt the house, and that was an adventure. That was an adventure for me because um, my mother had all these little things. Uh, the orders were recorded on three by five cards, and there were little notations to to see the sketch. And she threw out all the sketches because they didn't fit in her file. <laughs> so we had to. Luckily, the New York Times had. Uh, had planned to publish an article on their house about the same time my father's show opened. So they had done a complete photo record of the entire house. Uh, even though they didn't publish it, they let, allowed us access to those photographs that we could use for reference. So, you know, the stuff that said, see sketch something or other was in this place, in this room, and oh, it must have been such and such, and it must have been about yay long. And anyway, they had to rebuild the whole house, and we had to rebuild all the furniture. Some of it was a lot different than the original furniture. Of course, she wanted it bigger and better than the other ones because she was getting money from the insurance company to pay for it. They're both <laughs> gone now, so I can say this. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a difficult job, just, yeah. just even, oh, my daughter, Maria, my oldest, you know, she's, well, she's my only daughter <laughs> and the only one who's an architect, was working with me at the time. She had wanted to work with my father, but he was gone, so she condescended to work with me. <laughs> uh, but she helped um, retrieve the files and, and try to put them in order and try to, uh, to help me um, organize um, this order, which went on for three years. Um, and it was our main source of income um, after my father died. And it was uh, Evelyn Krosnick and Arthur, not so much, but mostly Evelyn, was my trainer. I mean, she was so demanding. And I think it was partly because she didn't like living in the hotel where she had to live because her house was gone. And she'd come over here and she'd spend all day looking for the right kind of wood to use in her house. So we saw a lot of her during those three years. There was a lot of, you know, backing and forthing about, you know, which piece of wood would be best and which corner it would fit in and how long it had to be. But thank goodness my daughter helped me through that. And Evelyn helped me through that, too. I mean, she was a really good trainer. I, I had no idea how Dad had to uh, work with clients and develop designs and find wood for the projects and until he was gone and I had to do it. <laughs> 
so you're rebuilding someone else's house, but you are also in a way kind of rebuilding this place in the aftermath of his loss. And it's incredible to think about looking at these past 33 years, because 25 years ago in 1998, you debuted a line of furniture, uh, Keisho, the Japanese word for continuity. Could you talk a little bit about that collection, but also this idea of continuity, how to, how to keep alive what your dad had sort of passed on to you? Right. Yeah, that's been um, an interesting project. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when my dad first died, we had three and a half year backlog of orders. But because the press had built up our business as being a one-man show, uh, the one man was gone, and he would not be able to sign his pieces as an artist would. And so I think at least 50% of our orders canceled. So that was kind of a bummer. The head man in the shop, and most of the men in the shop sort of stuck around for a while. Um, but the head man in the shop, Jerry Everett, and I looked at each other and I said, you know, after Dad died, I said, Jerry, what are we going to do? He says, well, I guess we just keep on going. And we looked at the pile of wood and decided, yeah, we better keep using that pile of wood. <laughs> there's, there's an incentive there to use that pile of wood. And the wood, the wood pile was so big that um, I think Dad had thought that he was going to run out of walnut trees or something. And um, he had this huge stack of wood that was stored in Philadelphia and the the company where it was stored was very, very kind. They had met my father in the 40s and were puzzled why he would want, how he could afford to buy East Indian laurel and walnut. And uh, they gave him some veneer luogs that weren't good enough for veneer, but he was very happy. He used them for tabletops and other things. So they put up with our wood pile um, until the day he died. And then they said, this stuff is taking up way too much room, um, and Nakashima's gone now. Please get this out of here. So you, you built the pole barn. That's when we built the pole barn, yeah. I, I looked for somewhere to store it, couldn't find any place that was suitable. So I told the zoning people that it was a temporary structure and we would not need it once we used up the lumber in there. So it's going to take longer than they thought it was going to, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not only an inspiration to go out there and look at the woodpile and imagine what those trees wanted to be, but um, it's our legacy. And Dad, you know, he specified how he wanted that wood cut, and he had an idea of what he wanted it to be. So we're very happy that we have this treasure trove of, of wood to work from and be inspired by. And Yeah, you, you've written of his lifelong love of trees and this quote, long, lonely battle against materialism and sensationalism, which seems more relevant than ever in, in our world of screens and the overwhelm that comes with just how we're infiltrated with information and even just how the world is built these days. So I wanted to ask how you kind of view this legacy now that you've been bringing it forward for so long. And I, I've always found it so impressive how you've both been able to follow in your father's footsteps, but also step outside of his shadow. Mm. Well, in the beginning, <laughs> when my father first died, she was insistent that George was still running the business. And that um, your mother, yes, and mm. she wanted me to sign George Nakashima on the bottom of all the furniture that came out after he was gone. I, you know, I said, well, my name isn't George. <laughs> um, and George isn't here anymore. But so I, I think I just signed everything Nakashima for a while because I couldn't figure out how, what to do with it. And then after a while, I think Bob A. Bell helped a lot with his uh, sponsoring shows at his gallery. Um, there was one that would, came out shortly after my father died, and uh, then there was that K show, and then there was a Shoki, and um, I think there are three or four shows that he uh, did for us. One thing that my father did not teach me, and I didn't realize was really important, was how to get publicity, how to create publicity. 
these people would come and interview him and you take pictures of him. And I thought, oh, dad just likes his ego stroked. You know? <laughs> I don't know what these people are doing here, but that's what kept him going. The problem with that is that, you know, everybody had this image that, that he was uh, making everything with his own two hands. A and myth then, almost. Huh? A myth almost. Yes, it was a myth. And he, nobody knew I was there. I'd been there for 20 years, but none of the rest of us were ever included in any of the articles. It was just my father occasionally my mother. My mother was complaining, too, that when he got his award at the National Arts Club, that nobody recognized what she did, which is important. She was the bookkeeper, and he probably wouldn't have been successful if she didn't keep the books. <laughs> she made sure that he collected money for his, his furniture instead of giving it away. <laughs> but um, And she was very organized and very disciplined. And I think that married her for that reason. He knew that... Uh, she would uh, keep him in line, <laughs> which she did. <laughs> hey, everyone. Taking another quick break here to quickly mention the Slowdown's new membership program. At just over $8 a month, it provides access to our slate of new member-only newsletters, in-depth stories, immersive interviews, and curated recommendations. If you haven't already checked it out and want to learn more, or if you'd simply like to support this podcast and all that we do at The Slowdown, go to slowdown.tv slash subscribe. That's slowdown.tv slash subscribe. And now, back to the episode. Could you talk a bit about stepping out of this shadow, which I know was probably a long, slow process, but in a way I would say you're very much known as the person who's brought this forward now because of the amount of time. I mean, 60 years since your family came to this property. I think it's almost 70, isn't it? Almost 70. Yeah. And you've been working here for, <laughs> you know, 53 years. Mm-hmm. That's true. I don't know. Um, Dad did instill in me the, the value of not letting your ego get in the way. And I, he used to talk to his clients, too. Uh, and I'd be listening in on Saturday. We used to have open hours on Saturday afternoon, and that would be the time when people would come and order furniture. So he would give almost, you know, Maybe not everybody, but oftentimes he would give people this lecture on how, you know, you shouldn't let your ego get in the way. So I heard that lecture so many times, I think it sank in. <laughs> <laughs> and in the beginning, my mother said, George is still running the show. And so I thought, okay, but there's a lot of work that George left behind. I think we need to finish it. There are people who are waiting for their furniture, they have put... No, actually, they didn't. That was the problem. When Dad passed away, my mother, in the very beginning, she used to collect uh, deposits when people would place an order. And then she got tired of keeping deposits because there were so many orders in the future. And so she did not have uh, deposits on any of that furniture that was on order when Dad passed away. So 50% of those orders did cancel, and there was no penalty for that because there was no money down. So um, after a, a while, we started asking for deposits. Well, actually, it was three and a half years before we finished the Krosnick project. So I didn't have to worry about that for three and a half years. They paid their bills. <laughs> but in the beginning, uh, I, I wasn't allowed to think that I had anything to do with, uh, you know, creating this furniture that that it was still George that was doing it. And then Bob A. Bell said, well, you have to make some designs that are your own, and then the design world will accept you. Otherwise, you know, people accuse me of making just reproductions, therefore they should be cheaper. And I said, well, it takes us the same amount of time to make them now as it did before, and we got to pay our bills. So I don't, I, I think I did take prices down a little bit, but but not that much. <laughs> so thanks to Bob and his publicity, I mean, he knew how to run publicity and publicists and so forth. And I did get a few articles. And, um, and in 2003, you published that book. Yeah, well, that was a long time. That was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I was, a part of that was 
because my cousin John Terry had done started doing research um, for a documentary film, he kind of showed me all these papers and stuff that were hiding in drawers and closets and suitcases and and he said, oh, this is really interesting stuff, and, and started getting it organized. And so I, I read them, too, and I got inspired and and decided, well, maybe I could write a book about this. This is really interesting stuff. So he started the, the research and the, the digging into the past and trying to figure out why George did what he did and, and created his film, and I did the same thing. Also, because I was trying to justify what I was doing. I didn't know why I was here, what I was doing, why I was doing it. It was, you know, it was just a job when I first came in 1970, but now it had to be something else. And I had to figure out why dad did what he did and what made him tick and and what was behind what he did. And I don't know if I figured it out or not, but I explored that in that book in 2003. And I would say explored it sense and and I think this one of the beautiful things about being here in this place and that I feel is so special sitting here with you is that it is this profoundly simple and beautiful setting full of simple and beautiful things that have amassed over time in New Hope and it's not lost on me that George believed there was this truth to be found in between sort of simplicity and beauty and and against odds he really proved that i think over time i was wondering how do you think about the enduring power of this place these creations the beautiful pieces that have been sh- created over more than half a century mm. well i we hope um that the buildings and the contents of the buildings will be preserved for as long as we can uh, for people to see and enjoy and be inspired by. And there's, there's a lot of knockoff Ashimas being made nowadays. (laughs) Knockoff (laughs) Ashimas. Yeah, that was my brother's term. (laughs) (laughs) But in the beginning, when dad started out, I think it was partly economic and necessity. Um, he couldn't afford to buy the good wood, so he bought the, the sort of cutoffs from <laughs> the lumber industry, the cast-offs from the lumber industry. And then as time went on, he got the cast-offs from the, um, the veneer industry. And, and the star- it, I think he may have been one of the first people to uh, mill logs through and through because he, he wanted to cut the... It was starting at the end of a log all the way through so that you got the natural edges of the tree on both sides of the plank that came off. And I don't know if anyone was actually doing that before Dad did that in the 40s. And that was thanks to the Thompsons who gave him these these logs that they didn't want, but they allowed him to mill them the way he wanted them milled. And uh, he oversaw the milling until the very end of his life. Um, I remember... He bought some bubinga logs that the this lumber broker had brought in from Africa, and they were huge. They were five, six feet in diameter and eleven feet long. And he said, "Well, this knife maker had ordered them, and they wanted to cut them up in little bitty one by one inch pieces." And he's, and Dad thought that was a shame, so he bought one of those, one or two of those, those bubinga logs, and uh, it was so expensive. He he sold half to his associates in in Japan. <laughs> But um, that was one of the first millings that I had to do solo because he'd had a stroke and he couldn't go to the sawmill anymore. And uh, that was an adventure. But I'd seen it done over and over again, and I figured, well, keep going with this. (laughs) What do you hope is the legacy of this place and of really, I think, your work, what you've built here over the past few decades? Well, what I've done, I just, I don't feel is my work particularly. It's just building on what dad left behind. Um, he left behind a huge pile of wood. He left behind a, a group of really tra- well-trained craftsmen. And John Lutz came in as our, although when dad, I guess it was mostly after my mother passed in 2004. I was just overwhelmed with work. I couldn't do it all. 
And um, so our accountant at the time said, well, you need a manager and you need an assistant designer. So I guess about 17 years ago, I got a manager and an assistant designer. <laughs> and it's been much better ever since, especially the manager part. Um, he's really good at multitasking. And uh, there are lots of things that, that need to be done. Oh, that's our, some of our dear walnuts falling <laughs> on the roof. <laughs> Tis the season. <laughs> but he's uh, he takes care of all the stuff that I don't like to take care of. And um, I have assistant designers. Now I have two assistant designers. I've never had two before. And they're both uh, wonderful, wonderful men. Uh, one is older than the other, but they're both strong and healthy and have good eyes and good hands and, and uh, good personalities. They're good at working with our clients. At one point, I thought that it would be important for it to be a family business. But right now, my grandson is the only one with us. And he has, I you know, I would like him to have a little more background in architecture and design before he comes in. And I don't know if he's even interested in that. <laughs> um uh, my oldest son was really interested in in running the business, but he went to business school. He also um, did a lot of woodworking when he was growing up. He studied woodworking when he was in high school, and he set up his own shop. and He was he's pretty good at, at woodworking, but um, his training in business school was in a way contrary to Nakashima and the way my parents set things up. He came in um, and he left several times. But while he was here, he would tell me, um, he said, oh, your father and your mother did everything wrong, and I'm going to fix this. And you don't have this, and you don't have that. And, and, and once you start focusing on the bottom line and productivity, you lose the quality, and you lose the, the craftsmanship and the camaraderie of craftsmanship, which is what makes us go. And the people that we have with us now are sensitive to that. It's interesting. There's a crossover not only uh, from the designer department to the the craftsman, but from the craftsman to the designer department. And I think that that uh, integration of craftsmanship and design is really important. And we have this huge pile of wood, and there's there's always more trees falling down that need harvesting. <laughs> so I hope that it, I mean, I really feel that, that maintaining this kind of a business, uh, working with natural materials, uh, working in this kind of an environment, and at this pace is really important as an antidote. And dad built his business as an antidote to the modern world. He was so upset when we thought about getting computers in the office. And my mother was insulted. She says, I'm the computer. We don't need another one, especially a mechanical one. And and dad didn't like it. And But he was dictating his letters to a very talented uh, woman who was good at taking shorthand. So he would dictate his letters to her and she'd take them down in shorthand. She typed them out on a manual typewriter. And we got our first computer in and she was able to type directly into the word processor. And he thought, oh, Computers aren't so bad after all. <laughs> now we can't live without them. But uh, it was a rough go there for a while. <laughs> I mean, you have to adapt. I mean, now we have how many computers in the office? We have three, one, four, seven computers in the office now. <laughs> and I don't know what we do without them. But uh, hopefully the handcraft part of it will continue as well. The spirit lives on. Let's hope it lives on. And we're we're so blessed with the people that we have on deck now. They're just John Lutz has been very uh selective about the people we hire and he and set up a you know, a very uh definite training system for um the woodworkers, which is a, a good thing. I mean people come in from different backgrounds. Usually people who come in with too much training, uh, are really hard to retrain. Because we had one woman who came in years ago, and she said, "I don't know why they do it this way." And uh, there's an easier way. There's a cheaper way. There's a faster way to do this. And and 
And Jerry, our head man, says, well, do it our way first. And then if you can think of a better way afterwards, you can do that. You can suggest that. But do it our way first. And she hasn't complained since. <laughs> <laughs> the Nakashima way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the most efficient. <laughs> The craftsmen have to have a certain amount of artistic ability as well as uh, woodworking skills. And the designer people have to have a certain amount of woodworking skills to understand what we're doing. And Dad set it up as an integrated process. I mean, we always lived uh, right where we worked. Uh, there was no separation. And I think that was what he picked up also from his experience at the ashram that you, you don't want to divide yourself into pieces, that you, you want to, to integrate your life and your work. So that's what he tried to do, and I don't know if that will continue because nobody actually lives on campus here anymore. <laughs> but let's hope that there will be an integrated furniture-making process anyway and that the campus will be, be preserved somehow or other into the future because... People seem to enjoy it. But it takes a lot of work. I mean, everything is getting older. Everything is falling apart one way or another. <laughs> it needs to be fixed. And that's why our foundation has taken on the responsibility of upkeeping the buildings and maintaining the insurance and uh, upkeep on, on the furniture and so forth. Mira, thank you so much for your time. It was really special to sit down with you today. Oh, thank you for yours. <laughs> it's a lovely day to have a conversation. <laughs> Extra thanks to our Season 8 presenting sponsor, the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. Van Cleef and Arpels' jewelry is characterized by a distinctive blend of poetry and refinement. With its iconic jewelry collections, it is an invitation to a timeless universe of beauty and harmony. You can discover more at vancleefarpels.com. That's V-A-N-C-L-E-E-F-A-R-P-E-L-S.com. And thank you for listening. You can find more episodes of Time Sensitive on our website, timesensitive.fm, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at slowdown.tv. To join the Slowdown's new membership program, which provides access to subscriber-only newsletters, in-depth stories, immersive interviews, and curated recommendations, go to slowdown.tv slash subscribe. That's slowdown.tv slash subscribe. Our theme music was composed by Billy Martin. This episode was produced by Ramon Broza, Emily Jang, Amy Hannon, Emily McDonald, Hazen Mayo, and Johnny Simon.